All righty. Hey, guys, welcome. Welcome to Inside Out. Um, this is uh, this is fun. This is cool for Jeremy and I. We've been looking forward to tonight for a while because it's just a, it's a very different night. Uh, it's a unique night. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jordan. I'm the Inside Out director here. This is my younger brother who is much bigger than me, uh, and his name is Jeremy. And uh, basically tonight, we're in part three of a series we've been in the last few weeks called I Have Questions. And we've been talking about a specific topic each night, but tonight... We're just going to answer questions that you guys have submitted. So over the past couple of weeks, you guys have submitted over 100 questions. We tried to put those into groups of the most common questions, and we're going to take our our best shot to just jump into those. And um, for the sake of time, I pretty much want to get started right away. I just want to acknowledge for you guys, though, we probably have two groups of people in the room. Some of you, you may not be satisfied with tonight because you asked a really big question, and we're going to give the two or three minute answers to these questions. So for you, this may just be the beginning of a conversation tonight. It doesn't mean you have to be fully satisfied. It might still mean there's a better answer out there, and this is just the start of a conversation. For others of you, uh, this isn't how we normally would do a message. There's kind of some assumptions in these questions. A lot of people have submitted these questions because it's like, man, I you know, believe in God already and stuff like that. We don't normally assume that in our messages, that that's where you're coming from. So it may feel like a lot to you. You might be like, man, I didn't have all those questions ahead of time. But wherever you're at, I hope it's beneficial to you guys tonight. Um, we're super excited to, uh, to jump in. Jeremy, I don't know if you have anything you'd add to that or... Yeah, I think uh, I would just say for me personally, the reason that I love that we get to do this series, you know, I grew up at Inside Out, I grew up going to it, um, and now getting to be a part of it in this way, is I would consider myself personally like kind of a more naturally skeptical person. And so uh, I need to go and do the research and kind of be objective and logical and come to kind of answers for myself. So if you are like that, if you are kind of naturally skeptical or you're going to push back and ask questions, I hope that this is helpful to you. And then if you're not like that, so you're like, I usually am just kind of good with being going with the flow, like I kind of take it for what it is. Um, I would just encourage you to kind of put on a a lens or perspective where you're just going to engage your your mind a little bit tonight. Um, Because if you haven't had some of these questions now, I think that there will be life circumstances or things that surface them later on in life. And so I think it's helpful to maybe get ahead of the curve and to begin to answer some of those questions. So I would just say, regardless of where you're on that spectrum, I hope that we just engage and it ultimately creates good conversations uh, later on in, in small groups. Cool. So here we go. You guys asked a ton of questions, asked really good questions. Uh, first one that I just felt like was necessary to address uh, was this question. I don't know who it was to, if it was me or Jeremy, but the question was Emily or Mowgli. And if you're new to Inside Out, um, this is who Emily and Mowgli is. Emily is my wife. Mowgli is my dog. Um, so for me, it would be Emily 100,000% of the time. If you're asking Emily, it'd be more of a toss up between me and Mowgli, it'd be like more 50 50 maybe. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if it was addressed to you, how you'd answer it. Um, yeah, Emily's fantastic, uh, but it would be Mowgli 100% of the time. Uh, that is my nephew, and, and I love him a lot. So There, there yeah. is a debate easy enough. between him and TZ, who was hosting about who the dog father is. Um, if anything were to happen to us, who gets Mowgli? But um, anyways, we'll, we'll move on to the maybe the more uh, for serious question on here that I thought was like a good first question uh, just for the nature of the series and where we're going, and that was, is it okay to have doubts? Because uh, maybe from where you come from or your church background, you think, you know, you're not supposed to. Like, you're just supposed to believe. Um, you're not supposed to push back or ask questions. Here at Inside Out, we're pretty much the exact opposite of that. We absolutely encourage you to ask your questions. I would say actually get comfortable having doubts because even if you get your current questions today answered, you'll probably have new ones in the future. But I wouldn't say get comfortable not addressing your doubts. Just get comfortable diving into them because your doubt is really that gap from where you are and maybe where you want to be the understanding you want to have. So I think if we're willing to engage our questions, there's a ton of growth opportunity there. Um, None of us have asked a question that somebody hasn't asked before. People have been asking these questions for thousands of years, and I think it's amazing to to jump into them together. So we absolutely encourage these. Don't ever feel bad in your small groups, you know, pushing back, disagreeing with somebody on stage or, or asking questions. Yeah, I'm going to jump into the next one in just a second. Before I do, I have uh, a, a, a letter here that has a question mark on it, um, and I need to give it to someone that's kind of up in front. A- Ainsley, here, raise your hand, so I'm going to give it to you, and I just need you to hold on to that, okay? I'm going to come back to it, and I'll explain why you have that um, in about 15 minutes or so, but I need you to hold on to that, uh, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But uh, my first question I want to talk about uh, myself is this right here is, is, could God have used the Big Bang to create the universe? Could God have used the Big Bang to create the universe? And so... Uh, 
the short answer to that question, in my opinion, is, is yes. I think he absolutely could have used the Big Bang to create the universe. If you are with us last week, Jim Yedlin talked about how ultimately science and faith are asking different questions, right? And science talks about how things happen. And, and faith in, in God and a relationship with God are really talking about the who and, and the, uh, the who behind the relationship and in terms of a relationship with God. But um, I, we still don't know like, how all that came to be and how all that came out, and, and I'm okay with that. But one thing that's really, really important for really everybody in this room to decide on for yourself is that regardless of your worldview, whether you consider yourself to be a theist, meaning you believe that there is a God, whether you'd say you're an atheist, meaning that you don't believe that there's a God, or you call yourself agnostic, hey, there might be, there might be a greater power, wherever it is that you land, every single person has to make the jump at the beginning of time from nothing to something. Everybody has to make the jump in creation that we're gonna go from nothing to something. And so what that means is that every single person in here has to offer a supernatural explanation for what we would pose as like a natural question, right? Well, how did it all get here? Is it science? All that stuff. No matter your worldview, you have to come to a supernatural explanation to go from nothing to something. So for me personally, that's why I'm content objectively, logically, scientifically saying that there must be a creator that is bigger than me outside of my context of time that started all of this or launched it because if I'm gonna go that there's no God and we went from nothing to something, well man, I'm gonna have to believe in something supernatural in order to explain that natural phenomena. So I think that's really important. And then, and then a follow-up question that, a lot, that came up uh, uh, quite a bit, which I was, uh, I really liked the question, was why did God even create us at all? Like, okay, there's creation, but like, why did he start all of this? Um, and, and one of the kind of Christian cliche answers to that is oftentimes, well, like, we're here to, to serve God, right? And, and I think that there's true and there's kind of some nobility in that answer. But I think at the same time, in Acts, uh, this, the, the Bible would say that, like, uh, that God isn't served by human hands, which me- leads us to believe that God actually doesn't need us to, to serve him. And I think that kind of thinking would be like this. If you imagine yourself married down the road or think of a husband and a wife, and they're getting ready to have kids or, or adopt kids, right? And it's like, you know, we have, uh, we got some lawn, you know, a lawn that, need, a lawn that needs to be mowed. Uh, we have some dishes that need to be done. We have some carpet that needs to be vacuumed. So we should have a child, right? That doesn't really make sense in our head. Like, that's just not how it works. We don't need someone to come and serve us. And I think that that would be kind of what, what that's saying if we went with what well, well, we're here to serve God. I think it's much more that we're here to, God wanted to give us relationship. He wanted to show and demonstrate his love through us and have a relationship with us, which is why he even created us in the first place. In a similar vein, there was a question of, if God knew we would sin in the beginning, why did he let it happen? And there were a lot of variations of this, but basically like, hey, if God knew it was going to go south, then why didn't he just do or create something different? And I think it's a really great question. I think kind of a simple answer to that actually goes to part one of this series, where we talked about God, if God is a God of love, love has to leave room for destruction, destructive decisions. Like there's part of our will that is free to not choose him, to choose something that's harmful to ourselves or harmful to others. Otherwise we would be ro- robots, we'd be you know, pre-programmed and that's not real love. So I think part of it is he loves us and so he had to give us that freedom and, and we, we did mess it up, we do sin all the time. There's another interesting part of that though that I think is even bigger. And there's a lot of things that you and I would not know about God, or we wouldn't think about God, or we wouldn't see him this way if it weren't for sin in the beginning, if it weren't for the fact that you and I sin, meaning God's forgiveness, right? God's unconditional love, nothing would test that. God's grace, God's mercy. If sin didn't exist in the world, we wouldn't even know that side, that character, those attributes of God. So to some extent, he gets bigger, more glorious as a result of how he's come alongside us, how he sent his son for us, et cetera. So there's a couple of big reasons why it actually is is better and essential um, that it started that way in the beginning. I think Jeremy Scott is going to tackle the next one here. You guys doing okay? Power through the first three. Good question. Okay, you. good. Energy good. Stay focused. Okay. This cool. next one uh, is, is easier. It doesn't require as much thought, but I think it's incredibly important. And the next question is, is how do you grow in your relationship with God or get back on track with him? This is a question that if you've ever crossed the line of faith, you are going to ask at some point if you haven't already. You're going to ask, how do I take my next steps in a relationship with God? But before I get to kind of the practicals, I, I want to emphasize in the question that it says, how do you grow in your relationship with God? How do you grow in your relationship with God? Meaning that it, the, the responsibility or the onus or the ownership of growing in a relationship with God is on you. 
A lot of times, especially if you found yourself, hey, maybe you, you placed your faith in Christ six months ago or a year ago or three years ago, three years ago or 10 years ago, it's easy to get to a place where it's like, I haven't grown in a long time and it's got to be my friend's fault. Well, man, I'm just hanging with the wrong people. It's got to be my small group leader's fault. If only they actually, they, if they'd showed up in this way, it's got to be the pastor's fault. He didn't say these things on stage. And it can be really easy to put the responsibility for your growth on someone else. But the responsibility is on you. And so I just wanted to be clear on that, that it is on us to take our next steps in our relationship with Christ. And then the kind of practical ways, there's so many different ways you can go about it. Four of them that we talk about here at North Point on a regular basis are these. It's, it's giving, trusting God with what we've been given and giving it back. It's serving, giving our most valuable resource, our time, and serving other people. It's getting in groups. It's doing what you're doing right now and being consistent, engaged in small groups. And it's inviting. It's going beyond yourself. It's prioritizing people that aren't currently in the room today and investing in them and loving them and inviting them to be a part of what's happening here. And when that's consistent, when, that develop, when those things develop into habits, you will see growth over time. You'll see little deposits over time that I think best answers how, how we can grow um, in our relationship with God. This next one I feel like is related to that question, and it's actually one that we got a lot of, which I think is cool because I think it's like an honest and a very vulnerable question, and that's why can't I always feel God when I want to? Why can't I feel like I used to? Why does God feel distant if he's real? Any combination of those questions, which I just think is, is a really, really great and honest question. And one thing that's been helpful to me, I think my counselor told me this like several years ago, and it's just stuck with me, but one thing that's clarifying is that feelings are not facts, right? They're important but feelings are not facts. There are so many things that go into your feelings. Feelings are incredibly complex. How much sleep you got last night, what you ate today, how much daylight there is, what time of year it is, hormones. If you just got in a fight with your best friend or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your parents, right? There are so many things that go into how we feel in any given moment. That doesn't mean that God is distant just because we feel like he's distant, okay? So the end goal may not actually be just this great feeling all the time. That might not be the best indicator of my relationship with God. But I think even more than that, there, there is a, a lot of times in a lot of ways a really great analogy between our relationship with God and our relationship with important people in our life, right? So this November, I'll have been in a relationship with Emily for 10 years now. And if I like had the same conversation with her every single day, like every single day, our only conversation was, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite color? And we went to like the exact same place every single time to, you know, on a date or whatever and never changed it up. And I never learned anything new about her. Um, we would not be growing in our relationship with one another, right? But some of us do that in our relationship with God. Like, on our best days, we give him a couple of minutes of our time. Most days, we don't even think about him. We don't go outside of our comfort zone. We don't try to invite somebody new. We don't, you know, read our Bible, or we don't maybe consider reading a new book about him or asking new questions about him, discovering new things about him. There's such an, an adventure in discovering who he is, but a lot of times, we don't take those steps. In fact, maybe we do the opposite. We kind of just do what we want to do, and then we have this wonder why God doesn't feel close. He's not punishing us. We just haven't taken kind of what Jeremy was saying, that ownership to take steps in his direction. So if God has felt distant to you, it may just be time to try something new and different and, and take a step in, in his direction that you haven't before. A lot of times when we do feel distance from God, I think we can ask this next question, which is, uh, how do I know what God's plan is for my life? Or how do you know what God's plan for you is? Um, so for, for just a, a quick moment, I, I want you uh, to think about, is that slide, can you put that next slide up there? On the screen so I can see that question. Cool. How do you know what God's plan is for you? For just a second, if you don't believe that there is a God, then I would just need you to pretend with me for a second. Um, if you do, then I just want you to think about this question. Like, think about me, you know, we're sitting one-on-one -on -one having coffee real quick, and I just ask you this question. Like, what is God's plan for your life? And I would think that as I ask you that question, I think if I asked your small group leaders that question, I think that there would be a million different answers and probably a lot of confusion, maybe even a lot of cloudiness to say, I, I have no idea um, what that is. And so before I get to discerning how we find out what God's plan is, uh, I want to talk or, or for you specifically or how you find that. I just want to talk about what God's plan is. Because um, my interpretation, what's been so helpful to me is think, to think of God's plan um, as much more of a direction than a roadmap. Right? To think of God's plan as a direction, then a roadmap. Like, that Jesus has said, like, hey, I want you to love, love me, love God, and love other people. And I want you to move in that direction. I want you to participate with me in your life. But I do not have it planned out to say, here's step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if at step seven, you go left instead of right, well, now it's all messed up, and you've messed up God's plan for your life. 
And so in terms of how you actually discern that, I think that especially if you're a junior or senior here in the room tonight, you're about to move into a phase of life, and it won't end for a really, really long time, where you have a ton of decisions to make in your life about where to go and what college and what major and what career and what family and where you're going to live and all these kinds of things. And it can feel like there is a right one and that you might end up missing that answer. And I just think that it's a lot more that if you can look down a path and say, hey, is, is making this decision like blatantly or inherently sinful? If it's sin or it's hurting you or it's hurting other people, then I would say that's not God's plan for your life, and that would be very clear. But I'd say if it's not, and you can say, I'm going to trust God, I'm going to participate with God in this decision in my life, that that is what he wants from us and what he wants us to do. So again, I think that it's really important to think of God's plan much more as a direction than a roadmap, and that can help provide a lot more clarity uh, around this question. Cool. We're, we're at seven out of 12, so we're over halfway already. Does that sound good? Hey, you guys, how many of you guys uh, like black coffee in here? You guys like... Okay. And everybody else? Cream, something else? Does anybody just not like coffee? Okay. Jeremy's drinking black coffee right now, and it makes me feel a little insecure about myself, because I'm like half cream, half coffee, and it just feels like more manly, he's four years younger, all these things. Anyways, random thought. Um, we're over halfway. Uh, next, next question. Um, we actually got a lot of uh, questions of what was in part one of the series, but that was why do bad things happen? to good people. Um, instead of really diving into this question, I actually just more want to point you guys to a resource. Um, in part one, we did give a couple of reasons. So we talked about the fact that love does leave room for destructive decisions. Like we talked about at the beginning of tonight, that because God loves us, we can do things that harm ourselves and harm other people. We're not robots. We talked about this idea that God is God and we are not. And just like a baby doesn't understand why it's getting shots from its parents at the end of the day, we can't understand all the things that God is doing, but that's actually a comforting thing at the end of the day. Um, we talked about good being the opposite of evil, and to some degree we know what good is because of evil. But that was a whole conversation. It was a big conversation. So instead, we get this question a lot, like, you know, if you miss a night or there's somebody in your small group that you wanted to share with or a friend who's never been inside out and you want to share a message, I'd rather just point you guys to this. Um, so if you do go to our Instagram and you click on the link tree there, a couple of lines down, um, the like third link on this next picture is watch messages. The fourth one on there right now goes to our YouTube channel that is just specific inside out messages. So you can go back and see any messages that we've done in inside out. If you do miss one, if you want to share one with somebody, etc. just want you guys to know that that exists. Um, and that one, the I have questions part one is the one where we actually answered that question of why do bad things happen to good people. So I want to let y'all know that one exists. Jeremy's jumping into question nine. Yeah, this next question, do our lives matter if God knows everything we're going to do ahead of time? Do our lives matter if God knows everything we're going to do ahead of time? Uh, this is a big, big question, and it's one that takes a lot of thought, and it, you can spend too much time thinking on it. Um, but the, the way that I want to go about answering it is to really clearly making a, a distinction between knowing a decision ahead of time and forcing a decision or knowing what you're going to do and forcing you to do what you're going to do. And so to do this, I, I want to go back to the letter that I gave Ainsley just a second ago. And uh, here in my hands, on, on the left side, I have a North Point staff member salad um, from likely in the last couple of weeks. It's pretty gross, pretty old. I just found it in the fridge about 20 minutes ago. I don't know whose it is. Um, and my right hand is a box of dozen Tiff's treats that I ordered at about 3.30 today. Okay, so these are relatively warm, and, uh, and they're 12 great tip Streets cookies, okay? So Ainsley, I have a question for you. If you were going to decide which one you wanted to eat, and I don't even say you have to share with your small group, you can if you'd like, but, but which of these would you go ahead and choose? Absolutely, the cookies. There you go. Now, Ainsley, what I'd like you to do is go ahead and, and open, up, open up the letter. Anyone else want the salad? You can have the salad. I don't know whose it is, actually. I shouldn't do that. They probably want their container. Okay, you can go ahead and, and read it real quick. I think I signed it at 306. And what did I say in it? I don't know who you are. But I know you will choose a dozen tip treats over someone else's old salad. Right. Now, Magic. there you go. No idea how she's going to choose that, but I believe, if she wasn't being difficult, that every single person in this room would say, I would rather have 
a dozen tips trees, right, over someone else's old salad. And you would say that every single time. And the reason that I know that from my context and understanding is because I've eaten tips treats, and I've not eaten someone else's old salad, but I've eaten old salad before, and I know that tips treats taste a lot better, right? So I understood the decision that was going to be made, but I didn't grab a hand or say, hey, this is what you have to go and do. So when it comes to God and the decisions of, in our life, right, how much greater is God's understanding about who we are, about our hurts, about the way we're created, about how everything else is intertwining in the world, right, and how much sense does it make that he could then understand the decision that we're going to make ahead of time without forcing us to make that decision. And so the results of that understanding is that we absolutely matter in an incredible way. We have the freedom to make the decisions we're going to make, but we have a God that knows us and loves us enough to understand and empathize with us and understand ahead of time what that decision is. So I think that's a really important distinction between forcing us to make a decision and understanding what we will do ahead of time. Okay, so this next one, just to like be authentic with you guys, I was nervous about trying to answer this in like three or four minutes because it's a really big question, um, but it was submitted a lot. Uh, I said from the beginning of the series, our heart is if you ask adult questions, we want to give you adult answers. So I at least want to start the conversation around this because I think it's a really, really good question. Um, and that is, if God loves everyone, why do people go to hell? Um, and there were lots of variations of this. What is hell was a question that came up a lot and stuff like that. Not a super common topic of conversation here at Inside Out. We're not going to try and scare you with it or anything like that, but it's absolutely talked about throughout scripture and a lot in the New Testament as well. Jesus talks about it as a real place, um, and so we will talk about it that way as well. But if you were to define hell, I think the simplest definition is separation from God. And heaven is the opposite of that, is community, community with God, intimacy with God. So it is this idea to say in this life, we have the opportunity because we're not robots. We keep going back to this. We have the opportunity to say, do I want to trust in what Jesus has done for me, spend forever in, with my heavenly father, be forgiven through what he's done, or do I want to go my own way? Do I want to do my own thing? That op uh, other option is hell, and that place is the opposite of all good things of this world. So that is lonely. That is the absence of hope. That is the absence of good relationships. That's what that place is. And I think it's fair to say, well, if God loves somebody, why would he choose that for them. And I think it's tough for us to say he really sends people there per se. Uh, there's, there's reasons why you could argue that, and I would get that. I think it's a little bit more like, man, he's, he's made himself clear to us. We get to choose if we want to place our trust in him or not. So to a, lot, to a large extent, we're choosing an opposite. And it's not so much even about like, how much good versus how much bad. We have broken something. We have broken a relationship with God that we just cannot repair on our own. We are sinners. He is holy. We can't be in that place with him unless that sin is paid for, which is only possible through what Jesus has done. It's not about how much good we have done or about how much bad we have done. I think one of the most helpful analogies I've ever heard regarding this, because certainly it's a, it's a question that makes me uncomfortable too, um, but the most, uh, the most helpful analogy I've heard is that the kind of consequence for any of your wrongs or the consequence for any of your sins is always comparable to the authority that you sin against. Here's what that means. That might be some fancy words or something. If I lie, like let's just take one sin. If I lie to a childhood friend, the worst thing that could happen is I lose that childhood friend. Like I'm young, I'm five, I lied to my five-year-old friend. He probably is gonna forget it three minutes later and we're gonna be fine. If I lie to my parents, okay, higher level of authority, still one sin, one lie, just one time. My parents, when I'm growing up, certainly zero to 18, they have a lot more authority. They can take away my car. They can ground me, whatever it might be. There are bigger consequences for that. If I lie to my university, to my college, one time, one lie, one sin, now my university can expel me. So if I cheat on a test or if I plagiarize, they can kick me out and I'm probably not getting into college anywhere else either. If I lie to the Supreme Court, which is the greatest authority that we have in the United States of America, if I lie one sin, one time to the Supreme Court, they can put me in prison. Those are all just one sin, one time, one lie, but the consequence got larger because the authority was bigger, okay? The authority of the Supreme Court compared to the God of the universe, if indeed he does exist, is like a drop of rain in the Pacific Ocean. The Supreme Court's authority is nothing compared to the authority of God, if indeed he exists. 
And we don't just sin one time, we sin every single day of our lives. We're in a constant state of it. We have broken something that we cannot repair. That's why the cross, that's why Jesus is necessary. We don't have a hope of our good outweighing our bad. This is something where the cross is necessary, which also makes Christianity very unique as well because Christianity does care about justice. Like guys, when you see the things you see on the news right now, you see a mass shooting, you see terrorism, and there's something that happens to you that gets angry. You're like, that shouldn't be that way. I promise you, God hates those things more than you do. And we have a faith where God chose to do something about it. In every other faith, God's like, well, you know, or the gods or whoever it is, if you have more good than bad, I'll just ignore the bad and turn the other way and no justice is done. In Christianity alone, you can be forgiven and justice is done because God loves the world enough to care about sin and take it seriously and punish it. And at the same time, he cares about people enough to take that punishment for us. And that is what happened at the cross. That's why it is essential that this place exists and why God can absolutely be loving. And at the same time, people can go here. I, it's a huge conversation in a couple of minutes. I hope that's at least helpful. And your small group leaders, I, I'd love to talk to you about it more um, if there's still kind of some big gaps there. But that also leads into another question that we got a lot of. And that question was, what is heaven like? Which I also don't really want to try to answer in just a couple of minutes. Um, I've never been there, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Jeremy's going to talk about some really cool resources at the end of this. But that is the opposite of everything we just talked about in hell. I'd rather almost talk about, just because we only have a couple minutes, what heaven is not. What heaven is not is it's not clouds and harps and music and church services for the rest of eternity. It's not that, okay? I actually get really frustrated because if you Google heaven in images, like the greatest database in the world that we have, you see nothing but clouds. And it just makes me so angry because that is not what heaven is like at all. Heaven is actually a very physical place. You will be you. You will not be an angel. You'll not be some kind of mist or something like that. You will be you. God didn't decide to just change everything because of your physical death. He always wanted to make a home here with us in a very physical place. So it's everything you love about this world without the bad. Just imagine friendships. Imagine relationships with no drama, with no jealousy, with no anger, with no selfishness. That's heaven. Imagine going to bed at night with no anxiety. Imagine traveling the world with no fear, right? Imagine the things we could do, that we could accomplish, that we could create, and all of this is in the presence of Jesus. That was what heaven is like. I wish we had more time today. Maybe we'll do a full message on it in the future. Um, but Jeremy, I know that you've got uh, a couple resources too to point people to on that. Yeah, I, I think just uh, spending time, this is one of those conversations around heaven that can really be a paradigm shifter in how you live every aspect of your life. Colossians 3, 2 says, um, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And I think if, if you adopt that perspective to say, I'm going to spend more time thinking about what's happening in the next life than this life. Um, it's so powerful in the way that we live uh, this life. But if you you're curious or want to learn more, a book that we've talked about a lot here is, is Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Um, and it's basically aggregating all of the things that, that uh, all the ways that heaven is talked about in scripture and just giving a really interesting uh, perspective. Again, no one, no one who's written that is on the other side of it, but he does a great job of using the Bible as the foundation of that and learning more. And another one, if you're like, hey, I want to do less study or not as much like, um, you know, theology around it, but I, I want to, you know, think about it, see what is that like. There's a really incredible book called Imagine Heaven, where um, a guy who, who's actually a pastor in this area, um, went out and did incredible research on people that had N, uh, NEDs, near, or NDEs, near-death experiences, and, and just explores what people experience on the bridge between life and death. And it's fascinating to hear their accounts of what they experience and their stories and the way that he validates them. And so both of those, Heaven and Imagine Heaven, uh, are great resources to spend time um, talking about those things. And, and we're about to go into our last question, which I would say, if you're tuned out, moved on, whatever, this is the most important question of the night, which is why we're finishing on it. And Jordan's going to finish with this one. Yeah, when Jeremy and I were, were talking about these ahead of time, just to credit him with it, he said, you know, it is interesting because we could disagree on all the previous 11 questions. Like, we'd have different opinions. You could just not care. You could find them boring. That's fine. But this is the question that we all kind of have to be on the same page about and make a decision about in our life. Um, and so that's why we wanted to end on it. But the last one is what determines whether or not we get into heaven. 
And there were various you know, versions of this as well. How do I know God and I are good? How do I know I'm going to heaven? Can I go to heaven still if I have done this or if I'm like this? All these kinds of things. And so we want to end on it this way. And I just want to share one verse uh, because it is so clarifying. It's in Romans and Paul writes this verse. Uh, and he says this. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is just not about your resume, which is a beautiful thing. It's not about the bad you have done. Nothing can disqualify you. There were so many things on there. We had all kinds of various questions. Can I go to heaven if I haven't been baptized? Can I go to heaven, you know, if this is my sexual orientation? Can I go to heaven if I've done this? Can I go to heaven if I have this question? There were so many of those. It's just not about your list. There's no bad that can disqualify you, and there is no good that can earn it. No amount of money you give, no matter how many times you pray and how many church services, it's not about your list. We just kind of talked about that earlier. Something is broke that we cannot fix. The divide is too big. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short. It is all about Jesus's list. That is the gospel. That is the good news. God cares about justice. He cares about punishment for sin, but he said, hey, I'll take it for you because I love you so much. And so if you believe that Jesus is Lord and you believe that in your heart, you say that out loud, that's it. It is about what Jesus has done for us and nothing else. That's the peace and the confidence that we can have. And I really do think if we're confused on all the other questions, this is the one that's most important that we're on the same page about. So again, those were 12. We try to group big questions together. If you guys have more, again, I just think tonight is more of a beginning than an end to your question. It's okay if you're not fully satisfied with it. Um, for the first time, actually in four years, I don't have a small group here at Inside Out. My senior guy, she's graduated. I'll hang back. I'll be around. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Have, and your small group leaders, uh, they give up so much time of their lives. They make a four-year commitment to you guys. They're crazy about y'all. They want to walk alongside you too uh, and address any of these things that you have or more that have come up. That's really awesome too. So I know that was some focused time. Thank you guys for tuning in with us. Um, Jeremy, if you want to pray for small groups and then we'll, uh, we'll break to this. Yep. i will love to do that. Heavenly Father, God, we are uh, just so grateful that we uh, have a place that you've given us to explore you, to find out about you, to ask honest questions, to adult questions, and uh, to get honest answers, God. Um, So thank you for that, and thank you for sending your son for us. Thank you for uh, the price that you paid so that we don't have to, and and that that's the foundation of our faith, God, that we can go back and forth on the other questions. We can run after them our whole life, Um, but we know the answer to the most important one of our life is, is that you have given your son for each and every one of us, even when we didn't deserve that. We are so thankful for that. God, would you lead our time and our conversations to continue to discern and discover and to learn more about you. We love you and we trust you with that. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.